Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Hey, it is great to be with you. For those joining online, we want to say welcome again, and we're glad that you've got that option. However, it's not the same without you here, so we'd love to see you. If you can, we understand if you can't, but we are continuing in our series in the book of Genesis. So if you brought your Bibles or your phony Bible, you can go ahead and turn there to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. That's kind of like the delayed. Some people started clapping early. It was just kind of the slow fizzle. That was was kind of pathetic, actually. I'm not going to lie. We get excited about the Word of God. Uh, We're continuing. End of 39. Last week, Pastor Jeff challenged us uh, through the Word to live a life of integrity and of purity, just as Joseph did. But it's really important to know this, that just because you do the right thing, Just because you say the right things, just because you live a godly life, it doesn't excuse you from pain or suffering or trials or tribulations in life. Like we see in scripture where Joseph was a man of integrity, he was a man of purity, he was loyal um, to to Potiphar, he uh, did the right thing when nobody else was looking, He, he made and said and did everything and it led him straight to prison. Right, Living a godly life doesn't excuse you from the trials of this world. But Jesus said in the Gospel of John, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. A life lived with God that has pains and trials and tribulations is far better than a life that is lived apart from God that might be relatively easy. See, when you live life apart from God, there's this emptiness, there's this void, there's this constant insecurity of where you're going to spend eternity. And and even if you have a relatively easy life, um, there is this void that comes and no amount of success or money or uh, earthly relationships can fill that void. And I don't want anyone here to live life apart from a relationship with God. And that's my heart this morning. At the end, I'm going to give opportunity for people to say yes to stepping into a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. And and in doing so, you not only get to spend eternity and forever with him, but you get to step into what Jesus describes as having abundant life. Life where God walks with you. I can't fathom going through life And not having the spirit of the living God inside me, helping me, speaking wisdom to me when my wisdom falls short, like my my stock isn't that great, you know, with the, the wisdom. I'm just teasing, Dad, right? But the spirit of God is with us, and, and I want that for everyone here to know that God is with you and He's for you. In in chapter 39 we see that God was with Joseph. Four times it says that God was with him. In verse 2, 3, 21, and 23, God was with Joseph. So let's pick up where we left off last week, verse 20 of Genesis 39. And today, I'm going to read a lot of scripture, okay? That is even more awkward. (laughs) Okay, we're going to try this from the start, okay? If you're new to New Hope or you're watching online, When we announce where we're going to be reading the word of God, people celebrate and we are to clap and raise our voice. Why? Because we get excited about the word of God because the word of God transforms hearts and minds. So today, you guys ready for this? I'm teeing this up as easy as it can be. Today, we are reading in Genesis chapter 39. There we go. Man. Before we do, let's pray. God, help me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Verse 20, we're reading a lot of scripture today. Stick with me. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was, here it is, he was with him. And he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. A couple things to note. One, the Lord was with him. 
the Lord was with him, but two, he was thrown unfairly into this prison and, and he had a decision to make. He could lie down and complain and wallow and, and just self-pity or he could go to work. And what we see him do is he gets up and he starts to be faithful and he starts to work so much that he becomes the head prisoner of all the other prisoners. How weird would that be to be in prison yourself yet you're stewarding other prisoners, right? Joseph didn't sit and complain. He went to work and he, I'm sure he was dealing with stuff internally. Like he's processing being uh, abused by his brothers and accused uh, by Mrs. Potiphar and, 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 you know, all of these different things, but he went straight to work and you may feel that you got dealt an unfair hand. Anybody been dealt an unfair hand in life? right? You've got a decision every time that happens. You can either sit down and complain and sit back and say, woe is me. This is horrible. What did I do, God, to deserve this? The heaven is against me. All of these things. Or you can just get to work, trust that the Lord is with you, and allow him to vindicate you, allow him to elevate you. You trust in God by doing what you know you ought to do. And that is a lesson that we can learn. Continuing on in verse 40, or chapter 40, verse 1. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were being held in prison, had a dream on the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? Well, we both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. See, I want to point out a small detail here in, in verse 8. Joseph asks this rhetorical question. Do, do not interpretations belong to God? Now, the word God in Hebrew is the word Elohim, E L. O-H-I-M, Elohim. And in verse 8, it's actually Lelohim. L, there's an L in front of it, which is then transferred as belongs to God. Elohim is God. Lelohim belongs to God. And, and at this point in time, the Israelites didn't know the proper name of God. It wasn't until Exodus chapter 4 where, where Moses is revealed that God's personal name is Yahweh, right? The, the great I am, Yahweh. But what Joseph does in verse 8 is he sets God up to receive glory. He's like, hey, this isn't my giftedness. This isn't my wisdom. These interpretations belong to God. They belong to Elohim. This is God who is going to do this. What if when, before we prayed for healings or before we prayed for gifts to flow, what if we set God up for glory just like Joseph set God up for glory? God is looking for humble people to flow through his gifts and his power. So why? So that his glory would be made known. Let us become a humble church that makes God, makes sure that God receives the glory. So verse 9, continuing on, the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream, and he said to him, in my dream I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup into his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift your head up and restore you to your position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing to deserve being put into this dungeon. Joseph is saying, don't forget me. When this comes to pass, like, don't forget. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't forget about me, right? Wives, this is the opportunity. Nudge your husband. Don't forget about me. Come on. My birthday, anniversary, right? Verse 16, when the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. 
On my head were three baskets of bread, and in the top of the basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph says. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Now, how many have ever heard the expression, ignorance is bliss? (laughs) I feel like this is one of those times where he's probably going, "Eh, I probably wish I wouldn't have asked. Like, I would have enjoyed my last three days on earth not knowing what was going to happen, right? So what happens? Verse 20, we continue on. There's a lot of scripture. Now, the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all of his officials. And he lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. Turn to your neighbor and say, wah, wah, wah. Verse 1 of the next chapter, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. So Joseph says, don't forget me. And what does the cupbearer do? He forgets him. Now Joseph has been abused by his brothers, accused by Mrs. Potts, and forgotten by Chip the cupbearer. Okay? (laughs) Talk about an unfair hand. But, But through it all, Elohim, God, was with him. You can feel abused, you can feel neglected, you can feel all of these different things, and there might be truth to it, but God is with us. He is with his people. Continuing on in in chapter 41, Pharaoh has a dream, and, and none of his wise men or his magicians or his wise counsel could interpret the dream, and so we'll pick up in verse 9 of chapter 41, skipping down a few verses. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream. And no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. In verse 16, what does Joseph say? I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God, but Elohim will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Let's pause again. Joseph again. He sets God up for glory. He sets God up for receiving the glory. He's saying, I can't interpret it, but my God, my Elohim, Elohim, he will. And Joseph continues to walk in a spirit of humility so that God would receive glory. Would that be me? That is my heart's cry today, that that I would walk in a spirit of humility that no matter what God does through me, that it's not about an Austin Weaver show. It's not about a James Weaver show. It's not about a New Hope show. It's not about whoever it is. It's about God. It's about Elohim, that he would receive the glory. Help us, Jesus. Verse 17, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the back of the Nile, And when out of the river came up seven crows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. And after them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I had never seen such ugly cows in all of the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up seven fat cows that came up first. But then, even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. And in my dream, I saw seven heads of grain, 
full and good, growing on a single stalk. And after them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. But the thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. Verse 31, the abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come up upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all of his officials. In verse 38, Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Wow, what a crazy story. In in a matter of what appears to be a couple hours, Joseph goes from a prisoner in charge of prisoners to being equal with Pharaoh only to the respect uh, of the throne. He goes from being forgotten to being famous in the land. And as I was praying, God, this is so much text. There's so much good stuff in in this scripture. God, what is it that that you are wanting for us? What is it that you are wanting for me? What is it that this sermon's supposed to be about? Is it supposed to be about faithfulness? How Joseph was faithful to you and you were faithful to Joseph. Is it supposed to be a a message about not throwing in the towel when things get tough and, and how God can take what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it into something good? And, and I kept on coming back uh, to, to, to uh, this idea that what Joseph went through was m- for more than just himself. There's many truths in this story, but what Joseph went through was m- for more than just himself. God took these messy ingredients of abuse, of accusations, false accusations, of um, uh, being forgotten, and then he, he mixes that with faithfulness and integrity and purity, and he turns this into something so beautiful. And we'll read next week how God saves Joseph's family. And, and, and the future Israelites are saved because God elevated Joseph to a place of power. And I've heard sermons about how God was watching over his chosen people and how if it weren't for Joseph and what he endured, that the Israelites would have starved to death. And and, and praise God, right, that that he's always watching after his people. Like that that is God's provision right there. He's he's doing that and he's protecting his chosen people. He's he's honoring that that, uh, covenant that he made with Abraham so many years Uh, prior. And and I'm thankful that we serve a God who is faithful. But I believe even more than just protecting his chosen people, that this story reveals something about God's character that might often be missed. 
I, I don't think that Joseph ended up where he was to benefit only his family, the Israelites. I believe that Joseph was elevated for a much greater purpose. As I was studying, I, I learned that only two places in the Old Testament is there where person A interprets person B's dreams. And, and uh, the, those two incidents involve Joseph, which we just read about, but it, the second is Daniel. One at the beginning of the Old Testament, the other at the end of the Old Testament. And both times, here's where it's interesting, both times where person A interprets person B's dreams, it's from an Israelite to a non-Israelite. Just a quick brush up on the story of Daniel, if you want to turn to Daniel 2 or follow on the screens. He interprets King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and he has a very similar response. These stories are very similar in many ways uh, to Daniel interpreting his dream. Daniel 2.27, Daniel replies to King Nebuchadnezzar, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mysteries he has asked, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. And then he goes on to interpret the dream. And this sounds just like Joseph, right? He's saying all your people, all of your natural wisdom, all of these different things, they can't do it, but there's a God who can, right? And, and he, he's, just so you know, this isn't me interpreting it. This is my God Jumping to 46 of that same chapter, chapter 2. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him, and he made him rule over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Do you see the parallels between these two stories? You might as well just replace, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar for Pharaoh and, and Daniel for Joseph, and you've got almost identical stories here. God flowing through Joseph to interpret Pharaoh's dream and God flowing through Daniel to interpret the king of Babylon's dream wasn't only to save his chosen people. It wasn't only to elevate these two men to a place of authority and power. Hear me, church. It was to reveal his glory and his power to all the nations. King Nebuchadnezzar eventually makes a law later on in the story that all people must worship the God of Daniel. Pharaoh rhetorically asks this question, can we find another man that the, the Ruah of Elohim is in, that the spirit of God is in? The Israelites were supposed to be an evangelistic nation. They were supposed to be reaching. They were supposed to be influencing the world around them. They were supposed to be influencing the culture around them, not the other way around. And God, in his great grace and his love for all humanity, he begins to manifest his wisdom. He begins to manifest his power. And the results is that two world leaders, Pharaoh and King Neb, for a time being, at least acknowledge Elohim as being supreme. Could it be, church, that what Joseph went through was for more than personal character development, but it was so that others who don't know Elohim would know him? Could it be that whatever you are going through in your life and the season that you would rather not be in and the coworkers that you would not rather be around could it be that God has you there so that Elohim would be known? Here's where this message gets personal. It's easy to be open to God flowing through you while you're at church. It's easier to desire the gifts of healing and wisdom and prophetic words while in a safe environment like church. And I'm all for that. I love ministry time. I love time at the altar. I love praying for people, and I would encourage that. This is a great place and a safe place to hear from the Lord and, and to, in grace, have grace for one another that we're going to have the Spirit of God flow through us. That's personally, I'm going to make a plug for Sunday nights. That's why I love Sunday nights. 
Because it gives more time, more opportunity to not just exalt God and to praise him for who he is and all that he's done for us, but then to to be able to pray for needs and to have extended times in the altar. And I would encourage you, if you used to come to Sunday night church, you should. And while I'm at it, I'll just go ahead and preach a little. Is that okay? You know, sometimes people will give me a hard time. Why do you push Sunday nights? It's like, oh, you've got Sunday morning church, and then you've got Sunday school, and then you've got Wednesday night church, and then you've got, you, you want me to come back on Sunday night? Are you kidding me? How many hours a week do we spend at the ball fields? How many hours a week are we spending running our kids around going to dance? How many hours a week are we doing everything but being, have an opportunity to be in the presence of God with other family members in the family of God where God could do a mighty work? People say you want revival. People say we want, we want the spirit of God to move, yet we're just going to continue on doing everything that feeds the flesh that really doesn't pay any dividends in the long run, but we're not going to go after the, okay, I, I need to stop. I'm not yelling at people. I'm sorry if you're having PTSD right now. I'll give you a hug after service. I love you, but Sunday nights has an opportunity. And you can come to Sunday nights and you can sit and be religious, or you can come and participate and expect God to move. So I'm all for, hear me, I'm all for being open for the the gifts of God to flow through us in a church setting. We spent almost two months talking about 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, about the gifts of the Spirit. But if one of the main purposes why God demonstrates his power is to make the unbeliever believe, then shouldn't we be having a lot more altar moments outside of these walls? Ask yourself this. When was the last time that you out loud prayed with someone and for someone outside of these walls? It's easy to pray for faith that God would move mountains and cure cancer and dry up disease and open barren wombs and break addiction, standing in a church altar surrounded by faith-filled people. But what about praying boldly for those things outside in the world? What what happens when we, we, we are living in Egypt? What happens when we're living in Babylon? Are we open to the spirit, the ruah of Elohim to flow through us? Why? So that God would receive glory. You know the greatest way that God receives glory is when an unbeliever believes in his heart and confesses with his tongue that Jesus is Lord. And the greatest and I believe most practical way that God wants to do that is by showing off. Hey, I'd like to pray for you right now and this isn't of anything of me, I'm not a magician, this isn't because of me, it's because there's a father who has been elevated to the right hand of the throne of God and the miracles that he worked on earth over 2,000 years ago, he's still performing right now and, and I believe that God is gonna touch you and then you just pray in faith right there and put God to test. When, when are we going to uh, not allow Egypt to shape us, which we see later happens on as the Israelites, they become a godless nation. They grow, there was favor on them, but they just, they just continue to grow and grow and grow and, and they eventually pretty much renounce Elohim. When are we gonna put him to test? I, I, I don't wanna come across as, as judgmental or mean, so if I've stepped on your toes this morning, just know this, I stepped on all of my toes this week in preparing this. All of them. I've got no to- toes, I'm n- nubless this morning. I'm preaching to myself. I remember a couple months ago walking through Menards and I was in the Grimes Menards and I was walking down the main aisle, walked past the food section and I was headed back to the paint and the, getting some paint or caulk or I don't remember what it was I was getting. And um, as I walked by the food aisle, I noticed to my left this, this family, a, a mom, a dad, and, and then their son who was in a wheelchair, an electric wheelchair. And uh, I could tell... Uh, that, that they were like rural, you know, they had the rural look to them. They had the, the, the Wrangler jeans, you know, the boots. You got your side piece of the pliers and the leather holster right there, you know. It, just anybody got a pliers on them, on their holster? No? Have we gone completely? Oh, one, one over here. You got it right now? No, okay. We've gone Metro in this church. All right, here we go. Um, okay. The, uh, the, I mean, I, you could just tell. Like the mom looked like she could throw hay. 
And, and I, I just knew. And so I'm walking, I notice them, I smile at them. I get past it where the aisle is like right here and I kind of walk past and the Lord just stops me in my tracks and he's like, you need to go pray for that, that boy. And I, I'm standing in the middle main aisle of Menards and I'm like, God, do you really, is this, is this really you? And I pause for probably like, it is probably only like 10 seconds, but it felt like 30 seconds because, you know, when you're standing still in the middle of Menards, people are probably just thinking he forgot his list is probably what is happening. But I'm having a moment with God in the middle of Menards. And, and I'm like, and I take another step forward, and he goes, go now. And I was like, okay, you know. So I turn around, I walk up, and I just say, hey, you know, my name's Austin. I, uh, I just felt like God wanted me. To, to pray for you. And as I, I, I walked up, I saw this boy. He's probably, you know, he's 14 years old. He ended up telling me, but you could see his hands and his feet were like curled. I, I don't know the condition. I didn't ask the syndrome. They're curled and kind of pigeoned in. And his feet both just looked like, just like, if you had like the worst foot cramp in the world, just, just curled in. I asked him his name, he told me he was 14 years old. And I said, hey, listen, I believe that Jesus loves you. I mean, he's the one who's asking me to pray for you. And I believe that Jesus can heal you. And I began to share some testimonies of some healings that had taken place in church. Some of them on Sunday nights that had been recent. And I was trying to build his, his faith. And they're just kind of like looking at me. And I said, I eventually get to the point, I just, can I just pray for you? And they just kind of like, looked at me and he kind of gave me this smirk like you can try like I've been down this road before yeah I, you know I, I trust me I've said my fair share of prayers so I, I just asked if I could put my hand on his shoulder and I prayed I prayed specific things and uh, I, I, I get done praying I look up and his parents are just looking at me and and I, I wish that in that moment I could say that, you know, he stood up or his, his feet started to straighten out or his hands started to open up. No, the only thing that happened is I left a uh, family in the rice and pasta aisle at Menards looking at me like I was a crazy person. <laughs> but you know what? I don't regret being obedient to that moment because I don't know. No, don't celebrate me. Don't, don't celebrate me. Don't celebrate me. Please don't celebrate me ever. I pray that in that moment, and I have to trust God, that maybe he's walking today. I'm, I'm guessing that they drove in because there's not a whole lot of people in Grimes that dress like the way that they dressed, right? Maybe his hands released. Maybe he had night pains. Maybe it was not a physical thing that he needed in that moment. Maybe it was just that someone where it felt like he was being looked over constantly, that God saw him in that moment. And it had nothing to do with a physical healing, but it was just a loving God that, that just reassured him and made him feel loved. I don't know what the purpose of that was. I, I pray that someday that that had an eternal difference in that family, in the generations, whatever it is. But here's the point. God wants to flow through you the gifts of his spirit, not just at the altar on Sundays or Wednesdays, but he wants to flow through you in your workplace, in your schools, at a park, on a sports field when there's an injury, at a grocery store, at the bus stop, in the darkest places God wants to shine. Why? So that all people would know him so that Egypt would know him, so that Babylon would know him. Let's reclaim Egypt and Babylon and Urbandale and Johnson and Waukee and Bondurant and all the surrounding areas. How are we gonna do that? By giving God opportunity for him to receive glory, for him to do miracles. He wants to flow through you. How selfish would it be if the only time we really fervently prayed for people and believed and we laid hands on people when it says lay hands on the sick, it doesn't say that it has to be in an altar. It could be in the rice and pasta aisle. 
Church, when are we going to be the church? Tonight I'm preaching a message titled, Hey Neighbor. And, and this time that we, we our, our framework of thinking shifts a little bit. Who is our neighbor? What is the church called to do? Are we called just to bring people in? Or are we called to go out? Help us, God. Help us, God. Ask yourself, are you open to God using you outside of these walls? That's an easy question to say, well, yeah, I'm open. If you set it up on a T, what happens if it's a little bit inconvenient? What happens if it makes you late for your next appointment? What happens if it makes you late for your Zoom meeting? Would you stand to your feet? Help us, Jesus. Let's put away all distractions. Tune in. I'm going to ask, just people stay here if, if you can. We've got time. We can learn and glean a lot from the life of Joseph. And I, I hope that this is encouraged and challenged you as it has me. But really, this story of Joseph is more than just how it applies to our life. This story points to Jesus. Just as Joseph was abused, accused, and forgotten, Jesus was, was uh abused and beaten on the cross. He was falsely accused of all of these things he didn't do. And his disciples deserted him in the hour that he needed most. Just as Joseph, God was with him, God was with his son Jesus. Just like Joseph was exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh, Jesus is now exalted to the right hand of God. And just like Joseph was in the place to save people, Jesus Christ is in the place, the only place to save people. And we are here today, just like Joseph's family, just like Joseph's brothers, we are at the mercy and the will of Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful that we don't have to stand in fear or in wonder of how Jesus will respond when we ask him when we ask him for forgiveness, when we ask him for strength, when we ask him to be Lord and Savior. Would you close your eyes this morning? I've got two calls. The first is for salvation, for those who need to make Jesus Lord of their life. For the first time or once again, where you believe in your heart that Jesus has paid the price, the penalty for our sin, so that we can then stand in a right relationship with God. We confess with our tongue, but then there's this part of repenting. That, that literally means metanoia in the Greek. Meta, to change, noia, the mind. It's saying, God, I'm turning away from sin because I'm having a change of mind about sin. I, I literally am no longer desiring the things, and, and it's a work of the Spirit. It's a work of God. And so this morning, if you'd say, I don't know that I would make it to heaven. I know that I've walked away. And you say, I need salvation. I'm coming before Jesus, the person with all authority in all of heaven and all of earth. I'm coming before him and saying, Jesus, save me today. Would you just raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to pray for you. Is there anyone here? Just with me looking around. Hey, Jesus, I'm here for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The second call is this, is I will commit to being open to how God wants to flow through me. You say, I, I, uh, I want to, to have God flow through me. It, God's not gonna ask you to part a sea before he can trust you with small things. Now you're open, uh, you're saying this morning, I'm open to the gifts flowing through me. And that'd be you. And you'd say, I, I need to, to be more active outside of these walls. Not just a prayer warrior at the altar on Wednesdays, but I, I, I want to be interrupted by God so that all men might know him. Would you just raise your hand if that's you and just say, yes, that's me. Thank you, Lord. I pray right now that a move of your spirit would sweep over every hand that is up. God, it's not the wise that bring people into the kingdom of God. It's only by your spirit. 
And so right now, this morning, I pray that your spirit, the Ruah of Elohim, the spirit of God, would rest among your people. That every hand up, that every open heart would be filled, God. That, that as they go to their workplace, as they go and, and whatever their day brings them, that they would know that you are with them and that you want to restore people through them, God. And so I pray the gift of healing to rest upon these people. I pray the prophetic word of a word of knowledge or a word of discernment or whatever it is to rest upon your people for your glory, God. Not that new hope would be great, not that an individual would be elevated. God, we don't want the glory. You deserve it because we recognize it is from you. And so Jesus, open up our eyes that we might see people the way that you see them. Open up our hearts that we might be sensitive. God, may we not be slaves to our calendar. May we not be slaves to our own agenda. May we leave room and margin for you to move, God, because your ways are higher. Your ways are greater. And we want to see the world one for you. I thank you that you're a redemptive God. I thank you that that you are full of mercy and you are full of grace, that you remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We're going to sing this song, Build My Life, and and I chose this song uh, with the help of Christy, and, and I love this lyric in the chorus where it says, fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. That's my prayer this morning, to fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Let's sing this.